Why, the whole world will pay to see this. No chains will ever hold that. We'll give him more than chains. He's always been king of his world, but we'll teach him fear. We're millionaires, boys. I'll share it with all of you. Why, in a few months, it'll be up in lights on Broadway. Kong, the eighth wonder of the world! It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ticklish Business. I'm Kristen, joined, as always, by Samantha. This week, we're kicking off our first new episode of 2023 with the celebration of one of the quintessential films that every old Hollywood fan knows. It's the 90th anniversary of 1933's King Kong. And for a king-size show such as this, we couldn't have just one guest or two guests. We actually have three guests. This might be either the best idea we've ever had or the worst idea we've ever had. We will see. I am joined by the amazing King Kong-esque trio of Joe DeVito, James Dark, and Mark Vaz. Before we talk to all three of these amazing guys about King Kong, we'd like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, you should. We do additional bonus pods, including double features looking at remakes and based on a true podcast looking at biopics and true crime films. We also just did our bonus episode on Marion Davies that everybody can listen to, as well as our Six Weeks with the Thin Man series. We also give out regular care packages of movies and gifts and let you guess on an episode. It's at patreon.com slash ticklish biz. And don't forget to pre-order my upcoming book, but have you read the book? 52 Literary Gems That Inspired Our Favorite Movies coming out on March 7th. You can pre-order that wherever you get books. And our new Redbubble store has some fabulous art, all designed by our own Samantha Ellis, featuring your favorite stars, including our popular Judy Garland, Gene Kelly, Makoko, Coco mugs, and our Gene Kelly asswork mug. You can find that at redbubble.com slash people slash ticklish biz. Now, let's talk about King Kong. All three of you, of course, come to the King Kong world from predominantly Marion C. Cooper, who made this movie. I want to start doing a roundtable and introduce all of you to our listeners. I want to start with James, because I initially went to Mark, because I know he wrote the Cooper biography, but he talked about how that biography wouldn't exist without you, James. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about your work with Marion C. Cooper and how you came to King Kong. Well, I came to King Kong at the ripe age of eight years old. Like many of us did, comparatively speaking, depending on when you were eight or seven, (laughs) by watching King Kong whenever it came on Los Angeles television, I was absolutely mesmerized. Not only because of the topic and the monster, but also the music by Max Steiner. What an innovative thing this was. Even when I was eight in the mid-50s, this was a 1933 movie. And then I started seeing his name on other things. John Ford Westerns, Cinerama, Technicolor. And I began to see him in my early 20s as a very neglected Renaissance man, a 19th century man who brought ancient myths and stories into mixing it with 20th century technology, like the movies, airplanes, and widescreen movies. I began as curator of the Arts and Communications Archives in special collections at Brigham Young University in 1976. And as a manuscript curator, I was dedicated to going out and getting the original collections of motion picture producers, directors, actors, actresses. And one of the first ones I wanted to get was the Marion C. Cooper papers. Now, he had passed, but I corresponded with Dorothy Jordan, his widow. That began a three or four year corresponding relationship when eventually she said, yes, I will donate them to Brigham Young University. What a treasure trove that turned out to be. So I was at Brigham Young University for 41 years until 2017 when I retired. 
but the interest in Marion C. Cooper does not have an expiration date as far as I'm concerned. So that's one of the other reasons why I'm here. I love to talk about Coop. Well, Mark, you're the first person I went to when I was looking this up. You, of course, wrote a wonderful biography about Marion C. Cooper that I recommend everybody go read if you haven't. But you also have a deep authorial history with VFX and epic films and all sorts of things. How did you come to King Kong? The title of the biography is Living Dangerously, The Adventures of Marion C. Cooper, Creator of King Kong, which sums it all up. If you don't remember the first time I saw King Kong, probably as a kid, but I know I have seen it at my favorite movie theater in the world, which is San Francisco's Castro Theater. It's been a movie theater since 1928 or something. The smell of popcorn is in the air like incense. And that's my cathedral of movies. I saw so many movies there. I know I saw King Kong at one point. I saw a movie called Chang, which was the second movie done by Marion Cooper and his partner, Ernest Shodzak. Chang was actually, Cooper has called that his best movie. It formed the template for what became Kong in terms of the style of movie making, the pacing, the showmanship, the crowd-pleasing spectacle of it. So I saw Chang, and I read a local newspaper article, and one of the San Francisco papers had an article about, at the Castro Theater next week is going to be Chang, which hadn't been seen on a wide screen in a long time. That was a rare treat. I went to see Chang, and I read this article about Chang and the filmmakers, and it was, well, I got dazzled and beguiled and pulled in. And I started saying, hmm, I wonder if there are papers related to Marion C. Cooper. And that's what led me to Jim and BYU and the archives there and the Cooper papers, which were amazing. Joe, last but not least, what was your connection to King Kong? Well, it sounds like the nexus for all of us has been the King Kong film. That was the same for me as a boy in New York City. I was born in Midtown Manhattan and would regularly go by the Empire State Building. And as a little kid, when I first saw King Kong, back then in the late 50s, probably about 1960 was the first time I saw him when I was about three, three or four, on a little black and white 13-inch TV. And that was enough to just explode my brain because... Back then, you didn't have all of the things that you have now. A lot of robots and all different kinds of dinosaur toys. And you could watch the movies whenever you want on TV or on your DVD or stream it. Back then, I had a plastic dinosaur set and I had my dinosaur books. And all of a sudden, one day, my older brother, Vito DeVito, great name, also an artist, sat me down to watch King Kong. And for the first time, all of these things that were roaming around in my head, you're looking at them on the screen and they're real. It was as real to me as if I was there. As Ray Harryhausen has said, I've never been the same since. It's a great way to put it. That led to a lifelong fascination for me that eventually led to the Cooper family. I've been a representative for them for over 25 years now. I met them through Mark Vaz, and I met Jim Dark way back when, when I did the first prequel sequel on an artist illustrator. It was during the making of that that I met the Cooper family. We went into all things King Kong, and then as you get older, as Jim said in the beginning, I'm thinking about King Kong, but then as you get older and you learn more and more, you realize Marion C. Cooper was bigger than life. They just don't make them like him anymore. I don't know if they ever made him like him. In that regard, one thing leads to the next. And with Marion C. Cooper, it seems like there's always a next. It's not like one thing and you're done. He goes from one to the next to the next. And it's just a fascinating personality of unparalleled dimensions, as far as I can see in our general lifetime. Go back to Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, people like that. But Cooper was one of a kind. I'm going to save Samantha for last because I have a segue that I think is going to be a good one. Samantha, you remember when we were talking about this season, I said the first thing I want to do right off the bat is do King Kong because we talk a lot about 
the easiest way to get people into classic film. And a lot of people point to horror. Oh, you can show somebody Frankenstein. You can show somebody Dracula. And most people will like those movies. The quintessential Hollywood film, you have your Casablancas. But for me, it's King Kong because it's unlike any other movie that came before it or came after it. Because you can sit down and watch that movie. And even though it doesn't have the whiz bang of modern CGI, there's something tangible about the movie because of the miniatures and the effects work. You also have an incredibly adroit cast led by Samantha's favorite scream queen, Faye Ray. You watch that movie and it's cut into three very distinct parts, which is the lead up to the island, on the island. People are surprised that the Empire State Building is a really small portion of this movie. It's almost the end of a, about an hour and 40-ish minute film. And I remember going to a blockbuster. Actually, it might have been a Hollywood video. Either way, these things don't exist anymore. I, seeing the cover, the painted cover on a DVD, and it was right about the time I started thinking, oh, I'm going to watch some of these old movies and see what all the hubbub is. It was just unlike anything because of how distinctive it looks and how fresh the acting is. People give 1930s acting a bad rap. They assume it's very stilted. Yes, there are questionable, problematic things we're going to talk about, but it holds up. It holds up in a way that, not to disparage Peter Jackson, but I don't necessarily think his movie does. It's the quintessential classic film for me in so many ways that I just knew we had to talk about it. It's turning 90. Of course, you're going to know it's 90 years old, but it doesn't feel 90 years old like other movies. It's incredibly timeless. That's the thing that struck me the most when I watched this movie, just the timelessness of it beginning to end. And of course, some of the special effects now are considered dated, but for the time, it's truly incredible. A lot of it, I just consider a work of art and I had no idea about it because, as you said, people really only focus on that last five minutes. I didn't even know there were dinosaurs in the movie until I watched the movie <laughs> beginning to end. I was shocked. I'm like, there are dinosaurs in this? What is going on? I'm so glad that you all are here and able to talk about Marion C. Cooper and his incredible work and King Kong and the incredible special effects because they all are so worthy of praise. But I have to say that everyone stares at the ape in this movie. I stare at Faye Ray. <laughs> She's just so incredible here. And so much of what makes this movie timeless is how well she sells it. She sells it all so well. Just her screams, the terror in her eyes in every single scene. It wouldn't be a movie without Faye Ray. I have to agree with Samantha. Faye Ray is so great. And if you watch her in something, else like Mystery of the Wax Museum. It's a different type of performance. Say Ray got lumped in as this early scream queen. Oh, she's just there because she has a good set of pipes. Really, in this film more than any other, she really is this poor woman that's hijacked into adventure. It's 1933, so the Depression is on. She's clearly starving. If this was a pre-code film of any other stripe, this would be a cautionary tale about white slavery or something. And this dude gives her the spiel that like, every girl fresh off the bus in LA got, which is like, hey, you want to get on this boat and go make a movie? You really empathize with her as she's trying to make the best of all of these situations. At the end, yes, the relationship with her and Kong, if you can give it a relationship, is not as defined as other movies have presented it. I find it hilarious how if anything, later versions of this movie have really tried to... And Darrow and the ape, is that going to be a thing? I don't know why we emphasize this in later movies, but they have. There's just enough empathy for her as much as there is for King Kong, which is bizarre because this is a movie that has very thin characterization for everybody. One of the interesting things about King Kong is that character who does this movie expedition, Carl Denham, is Marion Cooper. Everything you see in that movie is practically autobiographical. He had the dream of Kong ever since he was a six-year-old kid and had been given a book by an uncle called Adventures and Explorations in Equatorial Africa. And in that book, it was all about this French explorer who is searching for a 
giant gorilla that was supposed to be spirit possessed, possessed by the spirits of the natives. Cooper was just so effective as a young boy by that, that he'd resolved to become an explorer. The Carl Denham who led movie expeditions, just like Coop did, he met his partner, showed sack and they did a movie called grass followed by Chang followed by a dramatic film called the four feathers. And each one of those three movies took them to faraway places. And that became their motto of their company, distant, difficult, and dangerous. And that summed up what they wanted to do. Toward the end of the 1920s, Cooper had gotten involved in the aviation industry. He became a board member of Pan American Airways. He recalled one day he was walking out of his midtown Manhattan aviation company office and heard a plane go overhead. And he looked up and he said, without any conscious thought, I imagined a giant grill on top of the skyscraper, which became, of course, the Empire State Building. But another thing about it was everything in his life and the people that are around him began to influence this idea he had including his friendship with a naturalist explorer named W. Douglas Burden, who did a great expedition to Komodo Island, and in fact brought back two live Komodo dragons. And that, of course, got Cooper going, because he had been on a filmmaking expedition and writing expedition. It was just an expedition of exploration on a ship called the Wisdom Two led by Captain Salisbury. During that expedition, they stopped at an island and encountered their own group of lizards. So Cooper and Burden became good friends, and Burden himself was so influenced by Chang, he wanted to make a film based on Chang, a natural drama, as Cooper and Shotsek put it. The other interesting thing about that Komodo expedition is Burden had a young and attractive young wife that he took on this expedition to Komodo Island. And evidently, at one point, the Komodo dragons and their prey, she got mixed up in them, either between them or whatever. And so the whole process of this young lady that, as one person put it, became Faye Ray, essentially, because as Cooper was discussing the idea of Kong with Burden and what he wanted to be Kong, part of the title, the very title came from that idea of Komodo, the hard case, he just liked the sound of it. And in Burden's book about his expedition to Komodo Island, he has a chapter called The King of Komodo. All these inspirations started getting Cooper's vivid imagination going, and he started imagining a woman and a giant gorilla and the skyscraper, all those bits of business. In fact, the New York sequence almost did not happen because there was a rights question with this film called The Lost World, which involved a lost world where explorers bring back dinosaurs to, in this case, it was London. But there is some concern about the legal rights, whether King Kong film could actually use that, those elements, or whether those were proprietary. So at one point, Cooper was ready to just say, okay, we will just end the movie on the island. So they weren't going to go to New York, which is unthinkable. I mean, even Cooper said, we won't have as good a picture unless we're bringing it back to civilization, but we'll have a damn good picture. That matter was evidently resolved. So they went full speed ahead with the New York part of it. But that's how that movie, like a lot of his films, they evolved, they grew, and sometimes there's just all these quirks of luck and good fortune that befell them. That last point that you made is one that I've contemplated often, and that is every time there's something great that happens like this, you've got the big three in music. You've got Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven. You've got Michelangelo, Raphael, Leonardo. I'm not doing it in chronological order, but you get my drift. It's all about timing. And Cooper was a dynamo who was in the right place at the right time when all of the other right people were there to pull off what the dream was that he had in his head. Being born in the late 1950s, I wonder, and Jim, we're close to each other. 
you're a little bit older than me, if you don't mind me saying, just by a couple of years. But can you imagine what it was like in 1933 when movies had only just introduced people talking in them just a couple of years before? And people were just getting used to hearing that people can talk on screen. You go from that to being able to visualize a dream of the kind that King Kong is, an epic fantasy like that, to take people into a world that they never even could have imagined in such a short period of time. And you had Willis O'Brien, who we need to do a shout out to, who Cooper Mark, if I'm not mistaken, he was going to do live action, literally considering using Komodo dragons and gorillas and right. never would have been able to pull it off in that would have way. Been a bloody mess. Exactly. But who was there at the right time with the right historical personages? A guy like Willis O'Brien, who essentially invented stop motion animation. I'm sure everybody knows what that is. It's like an animated cartoon, except in three dimensions. One little bit at a time, camera each time, 24 frames per second, and you get natural motion. He has somebody like Willis O'Brien who did the creation movie that wasn't working out because it didn't have somebody like Cooper behind it in order to organize it and bring it together story-wise. But yet, O'Brien had the wherewithal, and he was a genius in his own right. And Cooper was there to pull him, guys like Max Steiner. And Jim, I'll let you talk on all this, because I know you're an expert like no other on all this stuff. The idea is, is that King Kong introduced maybe 5, 10, 15 firsts in terms of movie making that had never really been done or had never been put together in such a way to create a film that, let's face it, it'll be around forever. But I'll stop there and Jim, let you jump in. Well, Joe and Mark, both of you have made excellent points that I would like to pivot off Mm -hmm. and maybe qualify a bit. One of the things that has always impressed me about Cooper is the quality that we've talked around and I would call it audaciousness. Yes, he was the right man at the right time, but Willis O'Brien was already doing work, had Mm -hmm. done work. Max Steiner was doing scores at RKO. I would like to argue a point, maybe exaggerate it for effect, but bring it up by saying he made it the right time because of his audaciousness. Well put. He put the thumb on Max Steiner and said, we want a big sound for a big picture. Steiner did a score that had never been done for motion pictures. Now, he had done what we call wall-to-wall scores, music from beginning to end, as early as 1932, just the year before the release of King Kong. But it was the same year that it was in production. The audacious Marion C. Cooper ramped it up a bit and wanted a bigger score for a bigger movie. And a movie unlike, as you said, Joe, no one had ever made before. Well, how do you do that? Well, you have enough uncanny insight to know who can do it, the animator and the musician. And among those 15 or so firsts that you mentioned, Joe, The music by Max Steiner converted Hollywood to the effectiveness of music. Composers would often say, or people, viewers would say, or producers, hard-headed producers would say, wait a minute, people were sick of musicals in 1929 and 1930. They didn't want to see any more of those in a movie. And they would ask questions such as, well, the music has to come from a radio, from a recognized source organically within the film, because people are going to ask, where's the music coming from? Well, another question has to be asked, where'd the camera come from? With King Kong, it meshed so beautifully that people didn't ask that question anymore. First of all, the movie is a fantasy. Add music to fantasy, and what do you have? An unforgettable experience where you don't even ask those questions anymore. Cooper was in the right place at the right time, but he made it the right product because he was a force of nature. He just went forward and did it. 
at almost the same time as King Kong, Cooper sold RKO, but mostly David O. Selznick, who was the executive producer of King Kong, on the idea of Technicolor, which had limped along since the early 1920s. Who made the difference? I would argue Marion C. Cooper. To champion three-strip Technicolor that then David O. Selznick put in Gone with the Wind, that sold Hollywood on color from then on. And then early 1950s with the threat of television and the reduced box office admissions in the early 50s, what did he do? He not only liked the distant, difficult, and dangerous, he also liked bigger than anybody else. So he backs this idea of a screen that is bigger than any other, filling 46 degrees of the human vision in Cinerama. And he was one of the founding fathers. And I would argue from the documentation in the Cooper papers, we have all the memos with all the people involved in Cinerama. Cooper was the one that pushed it. And that brought us widescreen movies that we still have. So I'd like so to call the audacious Marion C. Cooper. On the movie Chang, this was in like the 1920s. He did this process called magnoscope. So you're talking about widescreen for a big climactic scene in Chang, which was a showstopper. It was basically a gigantic herd of elephants that stampede a native village in Siam. From the very beginning, when it was very primitive, Cooper was using widescreen. And as far as a visual effects standpoint, King Kong in a lot of ways reminds me what George Lucas did with Star Wars, simply because George Lucas wanted to do things in a science fiction film that had never been done before. And wanted to have cameras operate certain ways. He wanted to have images in complex composite shots using an optical printer, it's called, which King Kong had in the form of Linwood Dunn at RKO's opticals department, where he, he created an optical printer that was used on not just Kong, but for many other pictures thereafter. An optical printer is essentially a re-photographing device. It helps make complex shots that are composite shots of different elements you can combine. And there were a lot of advantages that were available to Cooper and the production at the time, including rear screen projection, which is seen a lot in some of the sets. There's a giant scene where the beloved Fay Ray Kong puts her in a tree and he battles another dinosaur in that battle. That's a rear screen projection of the stop motion element, of course, blown up screen size. And so it looks with the taking camera is shooting Fay Ray in this prop tree that she's in and the screen. And it looks as one image. And that's what's so brilliant about King Kong that it involved what would be called animatronics. Fay Ray was often lifted up by Kong in his paw, which is a mechanical device or close up of the creature that were done as a full scale animatronic with levers and pulleys. People could operate it, make its mouth open, its eyes move. The full complement of effects technology that was created and advanced, and that's why someone pointed out to me once, other than the lamentable sequel, Son of Kong, that came out the very year, 1933, that Kong came out, there weren't other studios that were doing a King Kong because... They weren't really set up to do it. And it was a one-of-a-kind thing. There was only one Willis O'Brien stop-motion artist. There was animatronic effects. There was matte paintings. There was the optical printer. There was a whole slew of devices that were brought to bear through the prism of this almost poetry that Cooper had, where he imagined this is like Beauty and the Beast tale. He opened King Kong with this fake Arabian proverb about how beauty affected the beast, took some of the will out of him, and beauty was fatal to the beast. Um, the beast looked upon beauty and stayed his hand from killing, and from that moment, he was as one dead. You get an A+. plus. Just to round this out, 
for people who are new to Marion C. Cooper, in the middle of all of this, in the midst of everything that has just been said, that Jim said and Mark said, he fought in multiple wars. He was shot down in flames. He was in a Russian prisoner of war camp where he had to escape life and death hand-to-hand combat. He is a Polish national hero. He flew with the Flying Tigers and helped clear Chenault in World War II. He's a patriot of the First Order, literally putting his life on the line at every step of the way. And he put, if I'm not mistaken, when those things came and to come and defend his country, he stopped everything dead in its tracks. He could have been a millionaire multiple times over had he not gone and put his life on the line in so many other different ways and stayed. And he dropped it all and went and did all of these other things with all of that going on. Still got all of the things done and more than what we've been talking about now. It's amazing. I almost opened up the book I did, Living Dangerously, with that scene from World War I when he's shot down in flames. Mm. And what happened was he flew the DH-4 Liberty plane, which had the nickname of Flaming Coffins. That's a whole other issue. Cooper was a big proponent of air power and an acolyte of General Billy Mitchell, who made a gigantic scandal of the fact that there were people that were profiting off the war by uh, building these inferior cheap aircraft instead of the best aircraft they could. And it became a gigantic, huge deal. They're flying back. In fact, Cooper described a friend of his DH-4 plane. They were flying back to base. And then all of a sudden, these German fighters appear in the aerial dogfight like no other. And one buddy of his in an accompanying plane that was next to him blew up in a fireball. And then Cooper gets hit. And his rear observer and machine gunner, Edmund Leonard, Cooper was sure had been shot and killed. Meanwhile, his cockpit all of a sudden explodes in flame. His hands are badly burned. And as he's trying to deal with the stick and work it, he had to use his knees and elbows because his hands were getting so burned. And it was so painful. He was ready to literally jump out to his death. Better get it over with. But he looked in the back at his rear observer and Leonard, he saw his eyes were fluttering open. He had only been wounded. He wasn't dead. Cooper said, I can't just abandon my friend like this. So he got in He allowed the plane, this is in a tailspin, and he thought that if he accelerated into the fall, it would suck out the oxygen, which it actually did. And then he came to a landing. As he hit the ground, he didn't crash. He was going along the ground. And then, of course, the force of the impact did cause the plane to go up on its nose and the wings came off. Such a spectacular thing. What was the kicker to the whole thing is one of the guys who had been part of the group that shot them down had followed him down and landed. And and Cooper actually had landed right next to a German infantry camp. All the soldiers ran out to see these heroes who had landed this plane, even though the enemy, there was this respect. And the other plane that had been part of shooting them down landed and out came this German officer, fully bedecked with medals. He was in his uniform, and he came up to them and saluted. There was a gallantry to that in the romance of the air fighters. They didn't go up with parachutes either, which is why Cooper had to jump, because he didn't have a parachute, because that wasn't part of the code of honor. It wasn't part of the romance of flying, if you call that a romance. The German doctors did save his hands because he was so badly burned, although he had scars for the rest of his life, which helped him when he was in that Moscow prison camp because he was masquerading as a guy named Frank Mosher. He had some undergarments that were stenciled with the name of Frank Mosher that he had picked up. If they had known that this was Cooper, the American who had formed these mercenary airmen that were fighting alongside the Polish in their battle against the Bolsheviks, the invading Red Army after World War I. There's all this drama going on. He would have been killed instantly. Like what you're hearing? Then consider supporting Ticklish Business via Patreon. 
We host two additional bonus shows and special series like Six Weeks with the Thin Man, give out free merch, allow you to guess on an episode, and more. You can check it out at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. And if you want to take Ticklish Biz home with you, consider buying something from our Redbubble shop. You can find our holiday Jean and Judy Makoko mugs or get our newest design devoted to Jean Kelly's ahem, assets in an American in Paris on a variety of objects. It's at redbubble.com slash people slash ticklish biz. Now back to the show. What's incredible after hearing that entire story, when he's at the height of his fame, making all the money in the world is right at the heart of everything in Hollywood. Everything's revolving around him. He just drops it all and goes and does it again. Goes over to China to fight World War II. I'd like to depart from this a bit. We're still going to talk about Cooper, but I'm hoping this podcast inspires some people who've never seen King Kong to see it because it's every bit Marion C. Cooper's movie. But Mark, I have a question for you. When people see the movie, they're going to see on the title frames the name of Edgar Wallace. If this is a Marion C. Cooper movie, who was this Edgar Wallace and why is his name up there with screenplay and story credit? He was the writer that came from England to help Cooper. There were so many things happening that were inspiring Cooper, all the little bits that became magic, that became part of this mythological movie that became a classic. It was also not just that writer, but Cooper got Ruth Rose, who was married to his partner, Ernest Shodzak, who had been on numerous expeditions. And as Cooper told Ruth Rose to help put a a polish on the screenplay, he basically said, put us in it, which she did. The Carl Denham character came more and more the composite of Cooper and Shodzak. Wallace actually worked on the novelization of Kong. He ended up dying, unfortunately. He came to Hollywood to help Cooper write it, but he ended up getting pneumonia and passed away, sadly. This effort of a lot of different people contributing bits and pieces of it. And he was Um, a very well-known writer as well. He was famous in England and in the United States as a novelist. And so at least... I suspect they were using him for some name value on this revolutionary movie to help give it some credibility for people to whom the name Edgar Wallace would have meaning. The name value also definitely came from Fay Ray. She had built so much of her reputation in silent films. One of my favorites of hers is The Wedding March, Eric von Stroheim. You talk about first accomplished with this movie. I like to call Fay Ray the first Scream Queen. There are so many things that we were getting used to with the invention of sound. We were getting used to musicals, but we were also getting used to horror. No one had ever heard somebody scream. There had been horror silent films, but that was just such a new thing. The other thing that Fay Ray really set out to accomplish and the thing that she did accomplish There was not one woman in Hollywood at that time who starred in multiple horror films and enjoyed it. (laughs) There were certainly some who were contractually obligated to do so and didn't enjoy it. They avoided it at all costs as a genre because it was bad for their careers. B pictures, C pictures were the horror films of that time. But Faye embraced it. She starred in horror film after horror film, and they all did well. And she did such a good job. Right before she made King Kong, she did another classic Faye Ray did called The Most Dangerous Game. That's what I was just going to say. (laughs) Mark, didn't they both shoot at the same time? There's a lot of scenes in King Kong, a lot of sex. Actually, what won the backing of RKO, a lot of people actually, they kept asking Cooper, do a man in a gorilla suit. And as Cooper said, that would never have worked. Just think about it. There's something magical about that taking up an 18-inch sculpture, puppet essentially of Kong that was full with armatures that were articulated that you can move and animate. There's something magical about that. It wouldn't have worked, Cooper said. He held out against that. But to convince the brass, he shot a test reel in the back lot and on the set, the jungle set for Most Dangerous Game. And that, as well as production art, 
helped sell the film. The Clincher was the production concept art for Kong holding Fei Ray above the Empire State Building as these fighter planes are trying to shoot it and kill this marauding beast. Anybody who loves King Kong should definitely check out The Most Dangerous Game because you've got Fay Ray in it, Robert Armstrong plays her brother, and you got Noble Johnson who plays the chief in King Kong that announces all this stuff. He also is in The Most Dangerous Game, and it's a very cutting-edge movie for its time. Especially it's a, for the plot. I yes, very, very, very... And Joel Freaky. McRae, as anyone who listens to this podcast <laughs> knows, will pull all of us in. Yeah. <laughs> to talk about the human characters of this movie, you spend at least the first 45 minutes of King Kong with them. This is a movie that has so much build-up to something, and I can only imagine what audiences in the 30s thought with this poster, knowing how much they knew, and you're watching all these characters for 40-some-odd minutes. Where the hell is the ape? That's what I want which is hilarious that Peter Jackson thought he could sustain all that for three hours. I'm going to keep grousing about the 05 one. That was actually what RKO wanted. They wanted King Kong up front. And Cooper's philosophy of filmmaking, which he had done with Chang and Grass, was to build things up slowly. You introduce things. You make the audience feel comfortable, get to know the characters, the themes, the atmosphere. And then you hit the ground when you're ready to go and that's all set. You just power straight ahead. You just don't stop. You propel yourself forward. That was his key. He certainly did that in Chang, climaxing with the elephant stampede I mentioned that wrecks this village. King Kong had that same idea. There's not a wasted second. With Fay Ray's character, she's the only woman in this group, which is supposed to be a curse because you don't have women on boats. That's the old wives' tale. I like Faye Ray, especially in contrast to Bruce Cabot, who plays Jack Driscoll, the stark sea captain who's just like, I hate women. I actually find him to be insufferable in this. That was actually Ernest Shodzak had the same idea about women on expeditions <laughs> because the first film, Grass, Cooper and Shodzak were following a tribe in Persia, their migration. They had to migrate twice a year over these gigantic, across this raging river and across this glacial mountain to get to the land of grass. They had to do that twice because when grass died, when the cycle went, they had to go back and go back to the area where life would be blooming again. Everything would be in flower and there would be grass for their their herds, which was half a million animals, I think it was estimated, the tribes subsisted on. That was the big theme for Cooper, the elemental struggle to survive man against nature. So that was part of the primal energy that was in the King Kong as well. Man against nature, King Kong and the Empire State Building, the perfect metaphor for that. Once they get to Skull Island and become separated from everybody, and I can only imagine, I've read stories about her working with the armature and getting very tight around her sometimes. I think Victoria Riskin has in her book that at one point the armature closed up really tight. She couldn't move. And it's a testament to her acting that this is also a movie that the scandalousness of King Kong taking her clothes off at one point. She has no guile. She's such a good dare I say, straight man, in contrast to all of the other showmans or Jack's constant curmudgeonness. I want to go back to what we were talking about, the dinosaur fight. That sequence, I live near Universal Studios, and in the Kong 360 adventure, they recreate that sequence with the modern Kong, where he pulls the T-Rex jaws open. And I Never find it as painfully hard to watch as I do in 33. It is painful to actually watch because of how tactile it feels with the stop motion effects and that there is something tangible. Watching a CGI ape rip open the jaws of a CGI Tyrannosaurus Rex, there's no feeling there. You don't feel that. I love it. I do not exaggerate when I say that it genuinely created a fear that I never knew I had. I was like, I'm never (laughs) watching anything. Any zombie movie where their jaw is falling off, I think of King Kong 
I don't want that to happen to me. <laughs> it's very subliminal because when something is so real that you don't have to use your imagination and you're watching a movie, you know it's fake, but it's utterly real with the CGI now. But you don't engage the same way you should do when it's stop motion. I've talked about this before and other people have as well. But the jerky movements and everything, it's very dreamlike. And it enables you to project onto that scene in that way, as opposed to having everything spelled out for you so perfectly that you don't really have to engage that subconscious part of your mind. And that's why I find the, the hand-done animation by one person, not by 50 people working computers, it's much more direct and visceral in a roundabout way for those reasons. When I go back and I think of all those stop motion movies from obviously King Kong to me, greatest of them all, obviously all the Harryhausen films that followed, that, especially the Cyclops in the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, next to King Kong, that's the thing that stayed with me a very long time. There's that old axiom of people who go to movies. You have a willing suspension of disbelief. Yes. So when you combine that with the fantasy nature of the stop motion animation that increases the audience engagement to believe and participate in the fantasy. And that's why, for my money and my experience, stop motion animation beats the slick, smooth CGI for a much less impactful experience than the stop motion animation did. It brings up something that is probably the biggest criticism of this movie. It would be wrong of us to not talk about the issue that a lot of people say we've modernized King Kong, we've made all these remakes as an attempt to correct, and I put that in quotes, a lot of necessary racist imagery that is in this movie. I know it's obvious that people point out that King Kong has the exaggerated stereotypical facial features that a lot of Black caricatures have. But I didn't notice until I rewatched it this last time. There's a scene early when they get to Skull Island, they're having the ceremony and they're going to sacrifice a young black girl. And they say, well, we'll give you six of our women for one and Darrow. And I was really struck by that because I think more than anything, I don't think any of the sequels have ever really reconciled with that either. How the native population of Skull Island in this movie is one where they don't value their women. Samantha and I, we talk very openly about how do you reconcile classic films that have problematic elements? How do you watch and enjoy them today knowing what we know? I'm curious how you three look at classic filmdom, especially something like King Kong. Actually, you know, it's interesting. I've also read that there was this tendency in old features whenever they showed, quote unquote, an exotic people they often did it in a way that was demeaning. Cooper and Shotzak, they never did that. They met Holly Selassie, the ruler of Ethiopia, and he mustered out his warriors for them to photograph, which is an incredible experience. They ate and drank. They got to know the people that they were filming with, and they had the idea of natural drama, which was taking people that are not professional actors, but live in a place, in this case might be like Siam for Chang. They got to know their customs, their methods, and incorporated that in a fictional story. But using real tigers, real wild animals, they would catch and then use in the filming. And it was a process of really embracing these other cultures. Cooper and Shotzak actually felt that, quote unquote, primitive people were actually the true man, that it echoed back to our very beginnings, the primal fight against nature to survive. He felt that in some ways, a lot of the tribal people that he met and worked with and filmed were the true man. That whole Go Island Village sequence was actually inspired when Cooper was walking through RKO's back lot called The 40 Acres, and Busby Berkeley was working on a film called Bird of Paradise, and he was orchestrating a big tribal scene, a scene of people dancing and having this 
ritual. He was just so taken with that that he decided to have the sacrifice. Cooper wanted to do the sacrifice and everything living up to that with this bombastic scene with the village, totally teeming, animated, and full of this reverence. Because remember, they're worshiping. They're afraid of Kong and what lies beyond the wall. And the wall was put up by an ancient culture, as we know in the movie, that predated the Egyptians, maybe. So it's full of mystery. It's an island full of mystery. And Cooper like brought out that atavistic energy because he had experienced himself in Africa and Siam and in the Middle East, all over. It's element of true things that he encountered, he and Shotzak together. When you think of Marion C. Cooper, one thing that definitely surprised me looking at his filmography, the first instinct is to think of him as a director because he's the director of such an iconic movie. But you look at his filmography and you see all of the amazing movies he's produced and the volume of movies that he produced. Do you think of him more as a director or as a producer, or do you not fit him into any category? He's a creator. And a creator embraces all of those. As a story conceiver, as a writer, as a production supervisor, meaning a producer. And yes, he could direct, even though that wasn't his forte. Cooper's real forte is a creator, an idea man. And then, as I mentioned earlier, a force of nature who brings all of these disparate elements together into one almost seamless whole. How many people can really do that for decade after decade after decade after decade? That's very well put, Jim. I would say, taking it from a different angle, Generally speaking, we tend to try to categorize art and artists because art is infinite, art with a capital A. Even for creators and artists, sometimes it's difficult to try to encapsulate. So we create little segments of it. There's fine art, there's illustration, there's filmmaking, there's basket weaving, whatever. But in point of fact, the same way if you're flying over a country, you don't see divisions between states. They're artificial. Cooper was an artist, and art does not limit. So when you're a creator, you don't just say, okay, I'm only going to direct a film, or I'm only going to organize this, or I'm only going to do special effects here. You create. When you have ideas, sometimes they apply to one facet of art. Another idea may apply to another. What I love about Cooper was he didn't pigeonhole himself and only do one thing in one style. He created. There was no boundary to what he did. His ideas and his creation took him wherever they took him. Everything from flying airplanes to making King Kong and God knows what in between. That's what a true artist does. They just do. It's so easy to make the argument that that quality is what really defines a great artist and a great director, especially because so many of the directors that we continue to bring up in these conversations, Hitchcock, Preston Sturgis, Billy Wilder, they all were able to do multiple things and they got an idea for a production. However, they were able to help that come to fruition is the role that they put themselves in, whether that be writing the script or directing the movie. And they knew exactly who to get together for it, just like Cooper did. I would add this to that in terms of the cultural references that were being made before. When you look at the human race, you look at humanity. You go back to the caveman days all the way till now. It's been one long progression of, for lack of a better term, moral evolution in the sense that how we regard human life, how we deal with other human beings. We make a mistake if we try to judge past cultures by our standards. The same way I think a culture 50 years from now is going to judge us according to their standards, because we don't meet up to what they think is better. It's a matter of what was happening in the zeitgeist and in the world that a particular culture or film or whatever was living in at that time. And in regard to Cooper, I think he was very progressive. You had Noble Johnson and Clementi. They got lead 
credits in his movie. He was one of the first people to do that. Everything within its own context. And you could draw those kind of analogies for every culture on earth, white, black, yellow, green, and purple. You will come up with the same kind of bad guys, the same kind of good guys, but hopefully humanity as a whole is moving forward in a positive way so that more and more everybody becomes unified and one as we move along as human beings. It's important to keep those things in context when looking at the past as opposed to the present. I want to talk about the finale. The Empire State Building, all of that is iconic. And I think what I appreciate about this movie, again, to continue to disparage the Peter Jackson version, the sense of size feels more significant in this film than it does with the CGI ape on a CGI Empire State Building. You get the sense of scale with this movie. And even though you don't have extreme close-ups on Kong, you get the sadness. It's sad when he dies. You really are connected. And Mark, I piped Samantha for this. I know you have a really amazing story about Fay Ray and the Empire State Building. I'm eager for you to share it with everybody. For living dangerously, there were a number of opportunities to do things that got creative people together to talk about Coop, to talk about Kong. One of the things I did was got Ray Bradbury and Ray Harryhausen and Forrest Ackerman together at Clifton's Cafeteria, where they had once assembled as young boys for the Los Angeles Science Fiction League. Bradbury told us, he said, we were in love. We were going through the Depression, but we were in love with Jules Verne, with H.G. Wells, with fantasy, with science fiction, with movies. Had the opportunity to interview those guys all together talking about Kong and Cooper, and then meeting Vicki Riskin, daughter of Fay Ray, and a fellow named Justin Bud Clayton, who was a good friend of Fay Ray's in New York City. It was Bud that actually put the, the bee in my bonnet about, why don't you go up to the top of the Empire State Building with Fay Ray and Ray Harryhausen? Because Ray Harryhausen was going to be in New York at a certain point to do a book signing or something for one of the books he had done on his career. So sure enough, we made it happen. It was so very exciting that day. It was probably one of the greatest days of my life, actually, because Faye Ray came up. She came up in a taxi, and we met in front of the Empire State Building, and we entered. And of course, it had all been arranged and it had been publicized by the media. We walk in there, and it was kind of an amazing thing. There was this scrum of photographers. You can imagine how the movies with their cameras going. And Faye Ray, over here, over here, over here. And we went to the very, very top of the Empire State Building. We had to take three different elevators to get to the part under which Kong had been standing in the movie. And it was just this wonderful experience. When she came down the elevator, when we were done with it, we came out. She got <laughs> the taxi appeared and she got in the back seat and a little wave of her hand and she was off. I was standing next to a guy, a staff member at the Empire State Building, and he was just nodding and smiling, going, there goes a movie star. And that night was an amazing night because I was staying with a friend of mine who lived in New York near Union Square. And we went to dinner with a couple friends after that. And of course, he's a huge King Kong fan. As we come out of the restaurant, it is a downpour is a deluge of rain coming and it's a lightning storm we could see the empire state building from the restaurant and i was looking up at it and had this little imaginary little waking dream of cooper flying out of one of the lightning bolts and i ended the book with this reverie that i had about myth and magic and past and present merging fantasy and fact merging together and there was a famous King Kong publicity shot of the giant ape with lightning bolts around it. And it reminded me exactly of that. It was uncanny. What was interesting about that is that Bud Clayton called me a couple weeks later when Fay Ray passed away. Fay Ray's health had been failing. She was 97 when she passed, I believe it was. Bud actually took her out to Central Park on what turned out to be the last day of her 
life. She passed away the next day. He took her out in a wheelchair because she was very frail. She loved it. She had a great time in Central Park and enjoyed seeing there was someone painting in the park, and she just loved that. They went home that night, and what was the movie they saw, the last movie she saw in her life? King Kong. How bad? And, uh, oh. Bud called me. I think I was one of the first people to hear that Fay Ray had died from Bud. He called me. Mark, I just wanted to let you know Fay Ray passed away this morning. And it was kind of amazing to think about getting the chance to be with her and interview her for this book. That's an amazing note to go out on. I know we just scratched the surface of this movie. If anything, 90 years young, this movie still has the ability to have us talk for over an hour about the amazing everything. Cinematography, score, acting, special effects. It is an almost perfect movie. I'm so glad that I got to discuss it with all three of you. Thank you all so much. I want to give everybody an opportunity to share where fans can find out more about your work, contact you on social media. I'm going to start with Mark Vaz. Well, I'm one of those backward non-tech people, so I don't necessarily have a website that's active or anything. The last book I did was called Empire of the Superheroes, which was about America's creation of the comic book superhero and how that concept evolved and how it evolved through litigation at times. And it came out last year. Recommend people check that out if they wish. And of course, they can find your book any place that you buy books, your Marion C. Cooper book. Living Dangerously, unfortunately, is out of print at the moment. I'm hoping that sometime soon in the next year or so, it might get back into print. So that's something that I'm hoping for. And we'll fingers crossed. (laughs) James Dark, where can fans find you online? They can find me nowhere. (laughs) (laughs) I sort of like it. He's off the grid. I did write a book that is in its third revised edition called When Hollywood Came to Utah. Something that people don't know about, really. It's about the more than 1,000 feature motion pictures, television episodes, and TV movies shot in the state of Utah from 1913 up until the mid-2000s. John Ford Westerns, including Marion C. Cooper Westerns with John Wayne, co-produced with John Ford. And TV series like Yellowstone and Touched by an Angel, and a host of others filmed in Utah, when Hollywood came to Utah. Joe DeVito, what about you? Well, probably the most succinct way to put it is I have a website at kongskullisland.com, where you'll see everything there. On Facebook, it's Kong of Skull Island. And then there is King Kong of Skull Island, Exodus Part 1 is a book. King Kong of Skull Island, The Wall, Part 2. And they're both on Amazon. And Disney Plus is making a TV show based in that stuff. The Coopers and I have worked on it together for over 25 years now. If you go to those places, you'll find all kinds of extended information. And I thank you for having me be a part of it. That's going to close out Ticklish Business for today. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts. Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Reviews matter. So leave us one on Apple Podcasts. Five stars, please. You can follow us on Twitter at ticklish underscore biz, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at ticklish biz. You can follow me on Twitter at journeys underscore film, or find all of my stuff over at my new job at therap.com. Samantha Ellis, where are you online? Well, you can mostly find me at Classic Film Geek on Twitter. I'm also there on Instagram and TikTok. And you can find my blog at musingsofaclassicfilmatic.com. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do new content like our six weeks with the Thin Man series. So consider helping us out at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. My book, but have you read the book, is out March 7th. But you can pre-order it wherever you buy books. We will be returning on February 15th with a Valentine's Day tribute to our favorite messy classic film couples. Till then.